bevo.com. Tom, in your book, uh, Reimagine, you, um, you've got a great chapter in here which is talking about uh, the 50 great attributes of world-class leaders and the attributes that all those leaders have. So, but there's some interesting ones in there, like for example, they have a tendency to hang out with freaks, which I find personally reassuring. But maybe you could just, if you can, Tom, elaborate uh, just on some of these, um, these ones. So maybe we can start with leaders are rarely the best performers. It, it goes back to an earlier question. It's what a sports team understands. That, that the beginning of the day, the middle of the day, and the end of the day, you are as good as your talent. Uh, if you are a boss, you are not paid to be the best salesman, the best accountant, or what have you. You are paid to develop the best salesman, the best accountant, which we know in sport or the movies. Nobody said the director is supposed to be the best actor. We said the director is, is, is paid to be able to deal with these crazy personalities that typically they bring. And I think the same thing, again, is true in an accounting department where I want cool people doing interesting things. I mean, it's another topic. I believe that R&D is as important a word in counting logistics and HR as it is in new product development, but that's another point. That's cool. And what, what about uh, leaders are dealers in hope? I put it in a, in a slightly different way once. I said leaders are responsible for painting portraits of excellence. There's a, I think it's a Coleridge quote, but there's a quote that says something along the lines, there's nothing so contagious as enthusiasm. I really will draw the line in the sand on this one. You do not want a leader who is not enthusiastic, period. Uh, and I happen to believe, which is not exactly news, that you can probably help people with anything, but you can't train enthusiasm. Got to find it. And our dearly beloved friends in the HR department have got to bite their tongue and put it at the top of the list of traits for everybody. Housekeeper in the hotel. I mean, it's the person running the accounting department. Because the role of a fabulous accountant is to help people, to help the other departments they support. Uh, no enthusiasm, no hire. You know, even if you graduated first in your class, ah, I'm being a little too extreme. You know, in microbiology, I'm willing to take a dreary person who's, you know, 23 and clearly going to win the next Nobel Prize. I, right. I will acknowledge yeah, like exceptions that. to every rule. <laughs> and Tom, what about this one where it says uh, leaders have a tendency to be angry? Angry, yes. The, the, Warren Bennis, who is the guru of gurus in leadership, in my opinion, and one of the rare people who actually deserves that title, uh, you know, he, he, he says, and I think he's probably right, he is about so many things, he said nobody wants to be a leader per se, but you have such a compelling need to express yourself. You know, I'm not sure Churchill at 65 or whatever it was wanted to go through the hassle of being a prime minister even though politics was life, uh, but he had a point of view and he was pissed off for the future of this great nation. And, uh, and, I, and again, I think the same thing is as true for the person who takes over, well, for, I've used this example before, for the Richard, Ver Richard Branson, who, you know, who fundamentally says, why isn't flying in an airplane fun? It ought to be. And, and that's fury, anger, enthusiasm all mixed together, but it's all these soft factors. Tom, uh, <clears throat> leaders are great storytellers. Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly there is no question whatsoever that this is probably number one or number two on the list of, of political leadership skills. Prime ministers and presidents induce people to change things by telling stories. It is said that, and I don't remember this one, uh, but it is said that one of the keys that Reagan used, and he was influential, like him or not, relative to the ending of the Cold War, was he told this wonderful story about, you know, the grandchildren, you know, my grandchild, Harry, and your grandchild, whatever, I don't know many Russian names, and, and he riffed off of, the, you know, he's a great riffer to begin with, but, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was writing an introduction 
writing the editing, the introduction to a book that I've got coming out in a few months before we began, you know, began this interview. And I said, you know, I said, I'm trained as an engineer, I have an MBA, and I worked at McKinsey, but I really believe that the answer to all life's problems is a really good or good small story that illustrates a big point. And I had just written a little thing about a clean loo in a little restaurant in a small town, and I said, that's experience marketing. Uh, you know, and I'm delighted to have the term experience marketing because I think words are critically important, but you don't illustrate it with charts and graphs showing how many gallons of green paint Starbucks used. It's a little story of Howard Schultz tripping over an idea you know, on a visit to Inner Mongolia and translating it into a yet another advantage for Starbucks. They hang out with freaks. For senior people in big corporations, exposing yourself to variety is probably literally number one. And the world is changing, it's always changing, it's changing for every part of the organization, and you've somehow or other got to expose yourself to new stuff, wild stuff, crazy stuff. And, you know, I was, when I first went to work for McKinsey, I had an absolutely fabulous boss who was like this. And he had a lot of chutzpah as well. He would read an article in a journal somewhere, and it would be a cool article about something. And he was very mathematical. But he'd read an article and he'd call the guy and he would say, I see you're at Northwestern. I'm going to be in Chicago three weeks from now. Can we have lunch? but he almost always translated it into action. And so, again, I think it's, I mean, the, the, the uh, I know, I'm, you know, I love statistics, and so I know I use the term standard deviation too much, but the deviation from the norm of the number of the people you go to lunch with in the course of any month is horrifyingly small for most of us. And the wonderful news is you like your workmates. The bad news is, you go to lunch with the person you really like a lot, who you've gone to lunch with 37 times in the last three months. Uh, lovely lunch, ain't gonna learn anything new. Uh, again, partially, but not wholly, it is recruitable. I mean, there's a, there's a guy who wrote a book, I forgot, it was called Who, W-H-O, Who, and he said the single most significant thing that any enterprise does is the hiring decision, and almost none of us take it seriously enough. Uh, meaning I think I can help people. Well, there's a guy who runs, who runs leadership development at Google, I think, who says, I can't train good leaders. I can help pretty good leaders become a lot better. And I think an awful lot of these traits, I'm, I've, I've got a, you know, in my scientific bias sets, I think, you know, I agree with Malcolm Gladwell's outliers, 10,000 hours of practice are necessary, but if you can't carry a tune, 10,000 hours of practice probably aren't going to take you to Carnegie Hall. And so you got, you know, the, the, the genetic part helps. I have a gregarious mother. It helped, believe me. That's right. 10,000 hours of vocal training is nothing. <laughs> got to right. do anything for Absolutely. me on the, in, in the yeah. choir. <laughs> yeah. And Tom, what exactly do you mean when you say leaders break down barriers? I talk a lot, I write a lot, I write a lot more about today than ever before about barriers between functions, and I argue they're the number one problem associated with implementation. Uh, I, 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 I gave the boss a title in something I wrote one time, and I called him the CHRO, Chief Hurdle Removal Officer. Uh, I'm not supposed to do the work for you but I can really add value if I can take a little hurdle that looks to me, even though I'm not exalted, I'm just a first line, it, to me it looks this high, to you it looks that high. And just get some little bureaucratic impediment out of your way. Uh, I can call the guy, you know, you need an office for four guys who are working on your project. Uh, the best thing I can do for you is I happen to know the number two person in the facilities office and I call him up and I say, come on, Harry, don't take four, four weeks to get this thing done. My guys need a little office. Can you get them one by next week or can you get her one by this afternoon? I can take that project and, and, and make it a phenomenally more efficient by, 
I mean, you know, life is not easy, business is an art. At some level, people need to learn how to get around barriers like that, no issue. On the other hand, I, I, you know, I, I do believe that, you know, point being that you can have the greatest systems in the world, greatest software, greatest people, shit still happens. And uh, it's like a friend of mine who relative to the, you know, the, in this world where we have terrorism, et cetera, we can spend infinite amounts of money uh, on trying to find these SOBs before they hit us, but we also have to say, going to happen, and the money has got to be poured into the rapid response, you know, in the, in the same fashion. If you were, if you were a, uh, a Six Sigma quality person, you would say, make the police system perfect, let's not worry about what happens because it shouldn't happen. Right. If you're a prime minister or president, you say, going to happen, even though I can't say it in the public speech, we got to be ready to deal with it. And what about leaders are part of the action faction? Bizarrely enough, and I actually think this is relatively true, uh, the former vice chairman of GE worked for Welsh, Larry Bossidy, went on to run Allied and so on, wrote a book two or three years ago called Execution. I am in love with the book and I really haven't read it. <laughs> Not true, uh, but somewhat true. And I love it because, you know, in a world where there are 7,000 books on marketing and 7,000 books on finance, it may be the first serious book that had a title called Execution. And, you know, Bossidy says fundamentally you spend 90% of your time removing hurdles and focusing people on getting stuff done as opposed to 90% of your time focusing on the strategy. And so, you know, I, I had two commanding officers doing my, during my two tours of duty as a combat engineer in Vietnam. And uh, one of them, who I really learned this from, you know, basically said, Peter, your job is to build the damn things. I don't want reports on it, I want it built. There may be a monsoon, people may be shooting at you, you're being paid your $3,000 a year as a second lieutenant or ensign in the Navy to build. And then my second commanding officer, I barely exaggerate when I say he would rather have had a tidy report about something that was never finished than something that was finished, but the paperwork was lousy. And de facto, if not de jure, an awful lot of that goes on in business of the public sector, certainly in the private sector as well. And relative to my bias towards small and medium-sized companies, uh, huge amounts of bureaucracy seep in to the 10-person company by the time it becomes a 50-person company. You've got to get organized, but you can't let it strangle you. Yeah, this one's a good one because I know that a lot of leaders like to think, hey, they've escaped the sales department, but you say that leaders are salespeople extraordinaire. Every human being who succeeds, even at a technical discipline, is a good salesperson. All of life is sales. It's sales to your nine-year-old, literally, when you're trying to make a point, it is sales to 300 million people, well, let's say 200 million adults if you're Barack Obama trying to change the health care system in the United States. It's sales if you are a narrow-minded PhD in engineering who really would like to see people implement that shockingly cool idea that you have. The, you know, I had this wonderful little experience. I'd never heard it so clearly. Uh, my wife and I were on vacation in New Zealand, and we were at, a, you know, at an old sheep station that was now partially resort. And there was this guy, I would guess he was about 65, and he had been a, I don't think it's appropriate to mention his name, but he'd been a very successful television producer in Hollywood. And God knows we weren't talking about managing, we were just talking about, we were bullying, frankly. And he said, which was subsequently proved, he said, I had all these fabulous ideas. He said, and I just couldn't get them approved. And it was really making me angry at how stupid the people were who I was going to. 
and he said, I happened to have an insomniac night and I was watching television at say two o'clock in the morning and I watched one of these how to make a million dollars in real estate programs and it was really stupid except some of the tools weren't bad. He said, I invested two years in my life. He said, I must have bought 60 books on selling. He said, I went to some of those real estate conferences. And he said, I taught myself to be a good salesman. And as a result thereof, the good things that have happened to me came directly from that. But I thought that was kind of the best story I'd ever heard because, you know, again, and, and, and I, Many leaders understand it if they, well, two things. Uh, many leaders understand it, even if they don't do it particularly well. The people who make me angry are the people who are in charge of systems in the IS department or the person who's running a six-person training department who said, I have a PhD in training. I know my stuff. I'm not paid to be a salesman. And, you know, my bias is your PhD in training is relatively incidental if you're going to make a mark. You know, if you, ain't inter you know, if you ain't interested in sales, you ain't interested in getting things done, period. The other point I wanted to make, and it's a huge part of this new book that, that I'm writing, is I believe that disciplines like sales, disciplines like listening, are as amenable to study, practice, and mastery as is playing the cello or learning to be a fly fisherman. And one of the huge problems with certainly MBAs, but you and me in general, is the stuff, you know, listening not for you, but you really are a freak in that dimension. It's what you do for a living. That's not fair because there are a lot of people who, do, who are doing what you're doing who do it because they love to talk. You know, Chris Matthews, the political guy in the United States, has a program which fundamentally, I'm a foil. You know, he said, isn't that right, Tom? Four times in a half an hour. But, but it's, uh, you know, I was, when I was writing this book, and I'm a lousy listener, uh, I was saying that. I said, you know, you really, you've got to be a professional listener. Which I, and so I went to Amazon, and I found 70 or 80 books on listening. I have a wonderful book title for a book I'm not going to write. And it really is good. Trust me, this is good. Two words. And the two words are listen, talk. Because obviously, doesn't require graduation from the second grade. The two things that we do are listen and talk. Virtually nobody is trained in either one of them. And yet, both of them are as practicable, learnable, masteryable as learning to, you know, sail a 12-meter uh, yacht or, you know, become a fly fisherman or become a neurosurgeon. And if you do what the average business person does, that's what you do. That's your cello playing. That's your fly fishing. That's your... Uh, you know, your art, and, and we should, in, and again, I do believe in genetics, and, you know, maybe even the people who are the best sailors know the difference between a west wind and an east wind a little better than the average, but, you know, the, I mean, for heaven's sakes, if you think it's sport, you have the best athletes in the world, but what defines the winners from the losers at that high level? the practice and the quality thereof. And so uh, I, I, I want to professionalize the stuff that we really do. And the real stuff is relationships, and it's listening, and it's being able to present. A good friend of mine in senior management at a giant company says he spends 15 or 20 years developing a great person, and that great person flunks out because he makes two consecutive lousy presentations, each of them four minutes long to the board. I mean, we had the world's most improbable president of the United States, and he wouldn't be there if he hadn't made a 17-minute speech at the Democratic Convention in Boston in 2004. And, and, and interesting, because Obama is a good example, and he's a good example. 
I mean, he is, again, genetically, he's got a lovely temperament and he's got a brain probably to die for. He has trained, I was reading something about how Obama constructed his personality. Uh, and, you know, brick by brick, stone by stone, board by board, he did. And, and so, you know, it, it, it's, it just infuriates me that, you know, one, there, there are so many people who are so much smarter on this stuff and better than I am. And I would have read a lot of stuff and it's become one of my latest passions, the art and science of apologizing. Uh, which women may not need, but you and I need seriously. And so I became fascinated by it, and I go to Amazon, and there are 20 or 30 books on apologizing, on everything from Chernobyl to at home forgetting to take the garbage out. And they are written by leading philosophers from Oxford as well as self-help ninnies from God knows where. But, you know, it, 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 it is probably the best of the executive coaches. Is a, and I have problems with that discipline, but the good ones are good. Uh, Marshall Goldsmith says there's nothing more important in life than the ability to apologize with sincerity. My MBA course is going to have a whole course on apologizing, on appreciating and saying thank you, on listening, on presenting. And, uh, you know, there's the, the story I like to tell when I'm here, as opposed to seven other things when I'm in the U.S., is Edward VII was not supposed to be necessarily the brightest bulb in the, you know, in the closet. And he was not particularly respected uh, by your countrymen. Uh, and at a crucial moment, I think it was 1912 maybe, he goes over to France. He arrives in France. The French are out on the streets booing and hissing. Uh, Edward has the greatest 96 hours perhaps in the history of Britain. Uh, his French is gorgeous, his mastery of the language. He is a charming person. He goes to the opera, he goes to the ballet, he charms the dancers, he charms the actors, he's seen on the street. 96 hours later, he leaves, and excuse my rotten French pronunciation, the Parisians are once again lined up on the street saying, Viva, viva notre roi, long live our king. Now that didn't change the entire world at the moment. Twelve months later, after hard work, the detente between the Brits and the French is signed, and therein lies the story of effectiveness in World War I. And, you know, the, you know, the winning hand in World War I was a king who wasn't that bright and wasn't considered the best of the lot, who had 96 good hours in Paris and changed the world. And so why don't we teach Edward VII-ism as a course? And you know, I've, I've read a lot, uh, I give my left and right arms to meet him, on Mandela. Mandela is the same way. The, his 90th birthday, Time Magazine did a whole special issue and they had Mandela's, I think it was top five leadership traits. One of them was his smile. They said no human being on earth jailer or mate can resist, you know, the mate will run through machine gun fire, the jailer will treat you with respect, and it comes from his smile. Now, I don't think I can teach a person who's never smiled how to smile, but I think I can help people or send them off to a coach to not to wave my arms around, not to wave their arms around like I do, which has its limitations, but to be a little bit more animated to, you know, the, 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 the people who measure this stuff says you have, say you have seven seconds to make a first impression with somebody. I think you can work at the margin on that. Right. And these are the skills which, which leaders of nations and, you know, the, you know, Franklin Roosevelt famously once said, uh, the president has to be the nation's number one actor. 
And he, Orson Welles was the, uh, you know, the, the leading actor in the United States in Roosevelt's time. It's this wonderful story that's told. And Roosevelt meets Mr. Wells, and he, you know, however he did it, I guess Wells came around the table because of Roosevelt's infirmity, puts his on, arms around Wells, and he says, ah, Mr. Wells, Mr. Wells, America's two greatest actors finally meet. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And, you know, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's true, but it's also true at a less extraordinary level for the 25-year-old supervisor with her first first-line supervisorial job who is attempting to help the people in her department become more vivacious, energetic, enthusiastic about whatever it is they're doing. So, and, and it applies to the 21-year-old fresh-caught engineer who has a good idea, who's a junior member of a project team who would like to have somebody help him and you are in the sales, recruitment, and persuasion business as a 21-year-old engineering graduate at some level, uh, as much as Mr. Blair or Mr. Clinton or, uh, you know, or Mr. Obama <laughs> said in a soul voice relative to communication, God. <laughs>